Ένα μεγάλο ευχαριστώ σε όλου σα που ήρθατε και ένα μεγάλο ευχαριστώ στη Λεωνίδα και στο Βασίλη που με καλωσορίζουν. Thank you. I'll switch to English because we have a lot of people connecting remotely. So thank you all for coming. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Panoli for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, he's here only for two days for a mystery reason we have not heard so far, but we will uh, be happy when we get to know. Um, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure for me personally because I know Anoli for what, almost 30 years. Uh, he was a young kid and he's still a young kid. I still am. <laughs> uh, when we were... Men don't grow up, they just get older. Yeah. <laughs> so he's a professor of artificial intelligence and computer science at MIT. Uh, his research is about understanding the circuitry of human disease and searching for the causality in order to identify molecular underpinnings of all kinds uh, related to human diseases. He's one of the most uh, well-cited scientists with use of papers in top journals um, uh, and uh, understands, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he's an engineer, but he spends more time in uh, pathophysiology and talking about metal uh, metabolism and even schizophrenia, which is very interesting <laughs> to say the least. Um, he does that using um, uh, tools of computer science, uh, machine learning and AI. He has uh, authored more than 280 uh, uh, journals and uh, has been cited as, as 300,000 uh, times. Uh, he was awarded by uh, President Barack Obama, has uh, done amazing stuff uh, at MIT. He has uh, been part of TR35 many, many years ago. And uh, he will be back, by the way, in January. Without further ado, uh, I'll pass over the... Καλώ ήρθατε όλοι, ευχαριστώ και πολύ και πάλι και ευχαριστώ που τόσοι γνωστοί και φίλοι είσαστε εδώ. So thank you all online for joining as well. It's uh, lovely to see 62 online participants. So uh, some names I do recognize and from all over the world, this is kind of fun to basically see uh, that whether I'm in Boston, whether I'm in Greece, uh, we're all one tiny little village across the world. So um, what I'd like to tell you about today is um, how we can use AI for medicine and for innovation. So there's really three parts to the talk. The first is how do we, and let me hide some of these windows for the people in the room here. So hide video funnel, hide loading the controls, great. So there are really three parts to the talk. The first one is how do we understand and reverse disease circuitry with single cell genomics? Number two, how do we, and how do we use that to, to understand obesity, Alzheimer's, cardiac, cancer, and schizophrenia? Number two, how do we develop new therapeutics using these types of techniques for enabling personalized and precision medicine to understand the hallmarks of disease and to understand the language of protein structure and of chemical structure and of biological function? So we've all heard about AlphaFold, how it can go from sequence to structure. But the bigger challenge ahead of us is how do we go from structure to function? So what we're doing now is developing large language models and protein language models and graph neural networks to enable us to connect those two remaining components to be able to reason about how amino acids and structure connects to function. Can I ask all the people who are sitting on the edge to squeeze in so that others can come from the side? I am Greek, so I know about uh, arriving a little late. I still do that. So the second part is understanding how to, how to use AI to develop new therapeutics. And then the last part is going to be leading into the discussion with Leonidas Alexopoulos, one of my uh, heroes, uh, to basically discuss how AI can actually be used to help with innovation itself. And it might be a good idea to remove me as co-host so that it doesn't uh, beep every time. So whoever's the host, just removes, remove me as co-host so that it doesn't beep every time somebody joins. <clears throat> so then the third part will be, uh, how do we use AI to directly visualize the embedding space of what artificial intelligence is actually thinking? How do we use that to manipulate it, to create new ideas from that embedding space, and then to project back to create ideas, code, papers, conversations, collaboration, et cetera. 
So let me dive right in and uh, dive into the first part. How do we both understand and reverse disease circuitry at single cell resolution? So it starts with the promise and the challenge of genomic medicine. What is the promise of genomic medicine? What I'm showing you here is a genome-wide association study for obesity. This is body mass index, a measure of pachycardia obesity. And the question is, um, what are the genetic loci that correlate with obesity? And what you can see here is that there's one region that correlates with obesity. Why is that exciting? Because if we see this region here, we say, okay, there's something there that plays a causal role in obesity, okay? For a lot of epidemiology, it's all about correlation. If you live in a, I don't know, $5 million mansion by the waterfront, you're gonna live longer. Why? Is that because you, know, you have a nice view? Or is it because you also can afford better healthcare, better lifestyle, better food, et cetera? So is it a correlation because between where you live and your, and your longevity? Or is it really that there's a common factor that contributes to both, which is a better socioeconomic status, for example? So most of epidemiology across all of humanity has been about correlation. The difference with genetics is that it gives us causation because there's genetic variants that I inherited from my parents that are correlated with my disease outcome suggesting that they are playing a causal role. Everybody with me here? And why is causality exciting? Because then it gives us a handle to understand the mechanism of disease and therefore to discover new target genes, to develop new therapeutics, and to ultimately enable personalized medicine and precision medicine. By understanding the circuits, we know what will be causally impacting disease, and that allows us to now develop the therapeutics. Sounds good? Okay, so that's the promise. What's the challenge? The challenge is that if you look within the FTO region associated with obesity, you see that none of the genetic variants is in fact impacting the FTO gene directly. The protein is not directly affected. What does that mean? That means that we don't actually know that it's the true target gene. And what we showed in our own work is that the true target gene is actually 1.2 million letters away, several genes over. So even in a region that's as clearly well-defined with a single gene under the lamppost where the genetic association lies, that gene is not the true gene. How can that be? The reason is that in 93% of cases, disease variants are non-coding. That basically means that they are impacting not the protein, but the gene regulation, the circuitry, okay? What do I mean by circuitry? that these regions of association contain within them genetic variants, individual letter differences, which perturb regulatory motifs, which are normally bound by regulators to either activate or repress that region. When the motif is disrupted by these genetic variants, the regulator can no longer bind. And that means that the corresponding control region will be either turned on or turned off when you lose repression or when you lose activation. Everybody with me here? And that basically means that the target genes will be affected. And we need to understand where is this region active? What are the regulators upstream? What are the motifs? What are the variants? What are the downstream target genes? And what are the cell types and tissues of action? Everybody with me with circuitry? So that's what we want to do systematically, okay? So we need to understand the target gene, discover the causal variant, discover the cell type of action, find the relevant pathways and understand the mechanism. And the way that we do that, is by starting with genetic variants, genetic regions, and then profiling the impact of those regions at the molecular level, because that's where therapeutics act. If I develop a drug, it's going to be against the protein. If I don't know the protein, there's nothing to do. If I don't know the target gene, if I don't know the cell type, if I don't know the mechanism that I should be modulating. So that's why we need to translate regions into molecular phenotypes and ultimately circuits, and ultimately perturbation. Okay, good. So what do we measure at the molecular level? We can measure the expression of genes in response to these genetic variants or in response to the disease condition. So we're profiling the variation between healthy individuals 
that basically allows us to understand the impact of genetic variants alone, and also disease individuals to understand the combined effect of genetic variation and disease uh, a manifestation, which can have both genetic components, environmental com components, behavioral components, and so on and so forth. Okay, so basically your diet, your exercise, these are things that you know are behavioral. Some of those are affected by your brain. So yes, they might themselves have genetic causes, but you can trace it at the behavioral level. But regardless of whether something is directly impacted by genetics or by the environment, we will be able to pick it out through these studies. So what do we do? We basically do single cell profiling of RNA expression and epigenome modifications in both healthy and easy samples. We then gather massive data sets. We're talking about hundreds of millions of cells, which we then integrate each with 20,000 genes expressed. So basically we, we have this massive data set and that's where the computer science comes in. That's where we can integrate the data to predict driver genes, regions, cell types, pathways, mechanisms, et cetera. And we then have circuits that we can intervene on and we go and perturb those target genes or those regions or those cell types or those regulators to ultimately show that the causality was real, that we can truly target these biological pathways. Everybody with me here? Great. So then let's dive right in. Uh, how do we do that for the very first slide I showed you, FTO? And then I show you for the second slide, this is APOE, okay? So this is a genetic association with Alzheimer's disease. So APOE4, when you're homozygous, you have a tenfold increased risk for Alzheimer's. This is an enormous impact. If your homozygous risk for FTO, for the obesity allele, then you have one standard deviation higher weight as an adult, seven pounds of additional uh, weight. So this is, uh, you know, these are exceptions. These are very common and very big effect. But most of the time when something's very common, it has a modest effect. And that's where understanding not just the impact of the variant, but once we understand the corresponding circuit, even if the variant itself, a uh, lovely heart. So uh, Carlos, did you mean to uh, write something? Um, we, if not, we could erase it, whoever's the host. So <clears throat> um, even if the genetic variant itself has a modest effect, because it's causal, by understanding the circuitry, I can go and impact not the variant that might have a very, very small effect, but the genes downstream that have a much larger effect. Why is that? Because that variant is only impacting one of the enhancers and there's many enhancers for that gene and is impacting that enhancer only by a little bit. So it might cause the enhancer to change in activity by 20% and might cause the genes to change activity by you know 10% and might cause the pathway to change by, I don't know, 3% and the disease by 1%. But even if all that is true, and even if that genetic variant only impacts the disease by 1%, by modulating that gene a lot more than the 3% that the variant, the enhancer, and ultimately the target of the gene does, by manipulating that gene by a factor of five, I can get an enormous impact on the disease itself. Everybody with me here? Okay, awesome. Who feels that they're learning stuff? Raise your hands. Yes? Awesome. Good. <clears throat> okay, so how does that apply? And by the way, that's 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 why I do this lecture in person from uh, from Zoom. It wouldn't be the same. <clears throat> so, how how do we apply that to the FTO locus? So, step number one: What cell type does it even act in? So, I was one of the leaders of the Epigenomics Roadmap Consortium, and we basically have mapped the epigenome of hundreds of cells across 120 different tissues. What's the epigenome? So as you know, the DNA is a double helix, but it doesn't just float around inside the nucleus. It is wrapped around histone proteins. Every 147 base pairs, you have two loops, and, the, and you have about a 50 nucleotide linker. So you can think of them as 200 nucleotide chunks that basically map the entire human genome into what type of function does that region have? And these allow us to now say, okay, this is a mark of an enhancer. This is a mark of a promoter transcribed region. So what are enhancers? What are promoters? Promoters are the 
proximal regulatory elements that turn genes on and off. Enhancers are long range acting regulatory elements that loop around in the chromatin and turn genes on and off. Promoters are typically open, ready for business, regardless of the cell type. But without the enhancer, they don't function. The enhancers are extremely cell type specific. So every gene might have 20 enhancers, each functioning in a different tissue, in a different condition, in different environment. Everybody with me here? So basically, enhancers are the long range regulatory elements and promoters are the short range regulatory elements. So what did we find here? We found something that we call a super enhancer. Most enhancers are love free to 200, 400, 300 letters. This one is 12,000 letters, okay? So that basically means that it's not just like a little switch on the wall, it's the control panel in the basement that basically turns on the whole building, okay? What does that enhancer do? It basically functions in the progenitor cells of white fat or beige fat. What is white fat? White fat cells are the cells in your body that store excess calories. If you have too many burrata and you don't go running, you have excess calories. What are you going to do with them? You can store them because that's a good idea. It used to be a good idea up until like 1950 or so. When people had a scarcity of food, they don't know when the next bugatta will be. So you store every calorie for a rainy day. Okay. And my cells, thanks to mom and dad, who both gave me an obesity risk allele, uh, are storing every calorie. So basically I'm homozygous risk for obesity. So this is, you know, very relevant to my cells. So basically my cells store calories. Okay. Conversely, you can actually burn the calories. How? By activating your um, by activating your uh, my, your your mitochondria. So, what are mitochondria? Mitochondria are the energy organelles that produce ATP through oxfos or oxidative phosphorylation they basically are an extremely efficient form of energy production but they're also very good at burning calories so again you have your you got you haven't gone running today so what are you going to do you can burn the calories through heat through thermogenesis i don't need to explain to this crowd that it's heat generation so so basically these are actually the progenitor cells of either storing fat or burning fat. And the reason why these are white is because lipids are white. And the reason why these are brown is because of the iron in mitochondria, okay? So something tells us that it might be acting in your adipose tissue. Well, what are the target genes? That's where the three-dimensional folding of the chromosome comes in. And you can see these folds here on both the right and the left side along the genome. You see these long range connections that this region makes with multiple genes on the right and multiple genes on the left. We can then ask, how are these genes acting at the, um, at the molecular level? And what we're finding is that they are in fact turning on, these genetic variants are turning on two target genes, IRX5, which sits 1.2 million nucleotides away, and then IRX3 that sits 500,000 nucleotides away, okay? So FTO appears unchanged. This is crazy. Basically means that even in those genetic loci where we have a single gene, the true targets are actually elsewhere. Okay, everybody with me so far? Good. So we want to also understand the upstream regulation. How is this region of genetic association causing the change? Well, turns out that it, there's the single mutation that I carry changes a T into a C. That basically means that the AT-rich motif for the AT-rich interacting domain factor, ARID5B, can no longer be bound. This is a repressor that no, normally shuts off that mega enhancer here. And since it can no longer bound, the enhancer is derepressed. And then these genes are derepressed, okay? And then what do these genes do? They're negatively correlated with mitochondrial function. And indeed, the cells of the risk individuals have many fewer mitochondria. And they're positively associated with lipid metabolism. And indeed, the cells of carriers, of risk carriers, are increased in uh, size. Okay? That basically starts painting a picture of a shift from thermogenesis to lipogenesis with that genetic variant.
So we now have a circuit. We went from a region to a circuit. Why is that exciting? Because we can actually intervene. We can now go in and increase or decrease the target gene uh, or the upstream regulator. And we can even do CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to change that one letter. And what we see is that with a single letter change out of 3.2 billion letters in the DNA, we change a single letter and we can restore thermogenesis measured as oxygen consumption rate. That's phenomenal. That basically means that we have causality, that this is the variant. And indeed, this also changes all kinds of other stuff, not just that. Um, suddenly we see the light. Uh, we can also intervene at the organism level. Remember the variant typically has a small effect, but the target gene can have a dramatic effect. The variant changes seven pounds of an adult. This one leads to 50% loss in body weight. So when we use a dominant negative repressor of IRX3 under control of adipose promoter, we can basically rewire the circuit to now shut off thermogenesis, to shut off um, the uh, creation of lipids. And these mice are simply unable to make lipids. They're just not creating any white fat. When you do a dissection of their organs, they're completely bloody, healthy, red, there's no white fat. If you if you dissect an obese mouse, there's like you know white blobs everywhere. These are just like bloody red. It's a super healthy uh, brown adipose tissue. And when you put them on a high fat diet, these mice are unable to gain weight. Normal mice gain weight. These mice cannot gain weight. So basically, they don't eat more. They don't eat less. They don't exercise more. They don't exercise less. Nothing changes in that respect. It's just that when they're awake, they're burning more calories, and when they're asleep, they're burning more calories. Okay, so that's what we want to create. We want to do this for, you know, every region of the human genome. So let me give you a couple more examples. So we went through the APOE locus associated with Alzheimer's. We asked, okay, how does that act at the single cell level? So we looked at single cell uh, profiling. So this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Nature has an impact factor of, I don't know, 50. This one has an impact factor of 80. So it's like a very well-respected journal. It sounds like, oh, we just published at the local uh, newspaper. But no, it's, it's a good journal, trust me. Um, and then uh, this, this one we published in Nature last year, basically showing that if we take risk and non-risk carriers of APOE with E4, E3, and E34, we can basically see changes in lipid and cholesterol metabolism. It sounds weird. What does lipid metabolism and cholesterol have to do with Alzheimer's? Well, let me tell you that APOE stands for apolipoprotein E, so lipoprotein, it's a lipid transporter. So lipid transport is involved in many places. One is caloric needs of the neurons because they're consuming an enormous amount of energy. They are a tiny little, like three pound blob, and it burns 20% of our calories. Out of every five calories you burn, one goes to your brain. Okay, so keep thinking if you wanna stay lean. Uh, and also exercise. But anyway, so lipid metabolism is helpful for energy homeostasis. Number two, for transport, because they're hydrophobic molecules. So if you want to clear out amyloid plaques, apolipoprotein transporters are actually a very good class of molecules to clear the amyloid, which is associated with Alzheimer's. And they're also involved in the formation of myelination. So the myelin that protects your neurons is made of uh, lipids. So it's, a, it's you know, the, oligo, the oligodendrocytes uh, that are uh, involved in making the myelin that protects the neurons, both from damage as well as shields them electrically when they're sending the signal. This is made of lipids. And what we found is that the APOE4 individuals, the Alzheimer's risk individuals are lacking myelination, but they're showing increased cholesterol biosynthesis. So they're turning on biosynthesis of cholesterol and they're not making myelin. So what's going on? Turns out the cholesterol is actually getting stuck in the endoplasmic reticulum. Instead of getting transported out, as you see for APOE3 individuals, very clean endoplasmic reticulum. This is the export machinery of the cell. Here, they're full of lipids. So we basically said, great, let's fix transport. It's not the production, it's the transport that's the problem. So we use cyclodextrin, a uh, hydrophobic molecule, to basically facilitate cholesterol transport. 
and that restored myelination in the um, APOE4 iPSC-derived oligodendrocytes. So this is a human cell model of oligodendrocytes. And also in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, it actually restored cognition, okay? So that's a second example. We can address obesity, we can address Alzheimer's. What's a third giant killer in, the, in, 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 our, in our planet? It's basically cancer. And in particular, metastatic melanoma used to be a guaranteed death. It was a death sentence a few years ago. Until immunotherapy that basically activates your own immune cells and attacks the cancer. But immunotherapy only works for 50% of the patients. So we basically said, okay, how are these 50% different? So we did single cell profiling, epigenomic profiling, and sort of massive multiomic profiling of responders and non-responders. And we found dramatic differences in the targets of a regulator, suggesting that perhaps that could be a good target for combination treatment. We basically went in with immunotherapy and the combination treatment, and we found that the cancer, the metastatic melanoma in mice showed no recurrence. Okay, so again, we have dozens of these examples and we believe that this is a general methodology. Go from the region to a circuit to intervention. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little faster here. How do we find the epigenome? So we've written a series of papers to uh, basically understand the human epigenome, to predict the cell type of action, to then bridge the gap between genetic variation and disease by profiling intermediate molecular phenotypes on the way to disease. That allows us to, from the genetics, predict the intermediate molecular phenotypes and use those to predict new disease correlations that are now causal because this is the genetic component of the genetics. And we've basically gone uh, you know, uh, all, all out on understanding disease at single cell resolution, okay? And we basically profiled uh, cardiac disease, obesity, cancer, Alzheimer's, addiction, aging, multiple neurodegenerative disorders, frontotemporal dementia, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, Huntington's disease, multiple uh, impacts of pathogens in the brain. So how does HIV affect the brain? How does COVID affect the brain? How does cytomegalovirus and human simplex virus one affect the brain? How does schizophrenia and bipolar disorder act? Uh, how are they different from psychosis in the context of AD and from Down syndrome and from autism and so on and so forth? And in each of those, we basically have dozens of cell types, hundreds of thousands of cells. Uh, we have more than 20 million cells in these different studies, multiple tissues, multiple modalities across RNA, accessibility, spatial transcriptomics, subcellular. And what we're trying to do is computationally understand how are these genetic variants converging into a small number of pathways and hallmarks of disease. So again, uh, in nature a few years ago, in cell a few weeks ago, we basically have shown how Alzheimer's affects the progression and the expression of different genes and the epigenome of these different genes. We're able to discover subtypes of microglia. So these are the immune cells of the brain. And these are the most enriched genetically for Alzheimer's disease in a paper that we published in Nature in 2015. We basically have now found multiple subtypes of microglia and show that we can reprogram inflammatory microglia from Alzheimer's into homeostatic microglia by understanding the circuitry and the option regulators and being able to manipulate those and restore homeostatic features in this microglia. In the vasculature, in a paper in Nature last year and in Nature Neuroscience this year, we're basically showing how is the vasculature implicated in the changes that are happening with Alzheimer's disease. Microglia, five to 10% of the cells, vasculature, 0.3% of the cells. You have no chance of understanding it if you just look at tissue level. You have to really go to the single cell resolution. And then with imaging, we can now do spatial transcriptomics to understand how is individual transcripts, how are individual transcripts expressed in relationship to amyloid beta, to plaques, to um, vessels, and discover new classes of cells that are extremely cell type specific. So in this particular case, in coronary artery disease, we basically found that macrophages that engulf the lipids that are circulating in the bloodstream and that are causing plaques and ultimately heart failure, these macrophages that clear out these plaques and uh, engulf these lipids become foam cells just because of the shape that they, that they have. They're known as foam cells. And we're finding that they're very specifically expressed in the lumen of the spatial transcriptomics and have very specific changes uh, that, that now we are experimentally reprogramming macrophages so that they can clear out plaques to basically give another hope to patients that would otherwise have a heart attack. 
in schizophrenia, we're able to now start understanding what are the driver genes and cell types and the tissues of action of uh, schizophrenia individuals, predict cases versus controls. And in some places, surprise individuals by basically saying, oh, well, it turns out that this person would we would have predicted to be schizophrenic, but he was never diagnosed. Instead, however, his son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. That's remarkable because that's only one chance in a thousand to basically predict that. So that, that tells us that there's something here transcriptionally. Maybe that person is resilient. Maybe that person has other changes that may have somehow evaded the, the disease. But again, uh, you know, the transcriptional profiles were a very clear indication. In this particular case, individuals who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, but in fact showing control-like patterns, are enriched in a particular cell state that might be providing a second path to schizophrenia. We're able to predict regulators upstream and start modulating those. Um, for psychosis in AD, we're finding massive repression. So about half of individuals with Alzheimer's, the most severe Alzheimer's, show psychotic episodes. They're imagining things, they're having vision. You would think that this is an overactivation of the brain, but no, what we're finding is that it's actually a repression of the brain that causes these. And we are finding that this is actually associated with long range projecting neurons, which we're able to now validate experimentally. We're also studying addiction to basically find the driver cell types associated with dopamine uh, and opioid receptors, which are altered in the case of addiction. And specifically these AP1 family regulators associated with synaptic functions, providing again, therapeutic targets. In the context of ALS, a motor disorder, and FTD, a personality disorder, we're basically showing that, in fact, the two are nearly identical at the molecular level. They're changing the same long-range projection shells orthologously across the two brain regions, and, in fact, nearly identically in both brain regions for each of the disorders, suggesting that the two might actually be the same underlying disorder but have different names just because of where it manifests first. And, indeed, many of the patients that are diagnosed with one post-mortem are also diagnosed with a second, and many families where the same mutation is uh, co-inherited in different individuals, sometimes manifest as ALS or manifest as FDD, providing now a molecular basis for why the two might actually be the same disorder. We're looking at pathogen associated changes in Alzheimer's. We're finding changes in uh, lipid uh, pathways and um, vessel pathways, again, providing therapeutic targets. With COVID, we're finding an increase in the astrocyte populations and enrichments for endothelial functions and microglial functions, again, vasculature and immune, as you would expect. Looking at the epigenome of those cells, we're now predicting what are the upstream regulators, what are the cell types in, uh, of action. In addition to genetically inherited variants, we're look also looking at the impact of rare variants, and we're finding the somatic abundance of mutations in Alzheimer's individuals in these senescent cells that are losing their identity, in these de-identified cells. And these cells are associated with this global phenomenon of epigenome erosion, where instead of sort of maintaining the epigenome intact with all of the active regions active and the repressed regions repressed, you now have this flattening of the epigenome, not in early AD, only in late AD, where the open regions are closing and the closed regions are opening up, probably associated with falling off of the lamina uh, regions and this global uh, dysregulation. We've also studied how exercise impacts multiple tissues at the same time across blood and uh, muscle and fat cells and brain and liver and heart. And basically what we're seeing is that when you exercise, it actually reprograms your adipose stem cells. And it also sends signals through your T cells to multiple tissues. And it also impacts your brain. It reprograms your brain. All of you who exercise know this extraordinary effect that exercise has on the brain. And we're now finding the molecular underpinnings of those. And we're also using these diversity of 427 individuals associated with Alzheimer's to identify recurrent hallmarks. These are pathways that are repeatedly disrupted in different individuals whose combinations lead to distinct combinations of phenotypic signatures. So we believe that instead of thinking about Alzheimer's as a monolithic disorder, we should be thinking about what are the individual hallmarks and pathways and how are they combined in, in each patient so that we can develop pathway-focused therapeutics. 
And we're also using these uh, electronic health records and building these explainable machine learning models, these generalized additive models that allow us to now express these response curves of a risk factor with mortality, where as the risk factor increases, as you would expect, mortality increases, but then exactly at the number three, it goes back down. And exactly at number five, it goes back down. So what's going on here? What our model predicts is that there's an intervention that happens exactly at these round numbers. And that's indeed, again, exactly where the doctors intervene. So Goodhart's law says that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure because people are now going after that measure as their target. And what we would like to say is that when a biomarker leads to treatment, it ceases to be a good biomarker. And the idea here is that the biomarkers are both used to predict the outcome, but also to decide on treatments. So they are indicative of increased risk, but they're also indicative of treatment. And that's what leads to these discontinuities. And we've now written a large language model module that allows you to go through these discontinuities and automatically interpret them so that we can kind of help the, the doctors and sort of do this systematically. We've also developed a lot of these modular and programmable assays to be able to intervene at the genomic level by shutting off enhancers or turning them on, by editing individual SNPs, or by knocking down promoters and genes. Again, this is amazing at the cellular level, but ultimately we want to de develop therapeutics. We want to actually translate that to small molecules. So uh, in this particular case, we're, we're doing dozens of these edits in the mouse brain, but we now have a new program that actually uses these protein language models and large language models together to develop therapeutics. So the idea is that we want to design graph neural networks for each of the chemicals to be able to predict the function of a chemical from its parts by propagating these embeddings associated with the molecular structure of the corresponding chemicals. And we want to be able to do that systematically across many different therapeutic modalities. So we're building these foundation models, these AI foundation models that allows to connect protein structure, protein function described by BioGPT, genetics, and electronic health records to basically start building this discovery engine that is powered by AI. And in particular, we've built this model known as TXLLM for a therapeutic large language model that basically combines protein structure and biomedical text. So basically mining through the entire literature for every uh, protein in the human genome, looking at the structure of every protein through the human genome, and then taking queries that allow us to create these prompts to interact with the AI model to then prioritize proteins and domains and provide descriptions, predict proteins, and design uh, sort of low-level functions. What we're doing now is in the first stage, validating this using nominal targets. And we're also collaborating with Brad Pentelute in the chemistry department to actually test these predictions systematically by synthesizing them in the wet lab. And Brad had basically created these extraordinary pipelines that allow him to synthesize something that would take months and hours so we can sort of close that loop very rapidly. So on one hand, we're building in the sequence on the other of the protein. On the other hand, the description of that function, project them into the same embedding space. We call this the two tower model. This is the protein tower. This is the function tower. And we're basically pushing those in the same embedding space. And we're now complementing this with additional towers on the chemical space, where every part of a chemical has predicted embedding projections. And you're going through these graph convolutions through the GNN to basically predict features for every chemical. And we're doing this not just for the chemical side, but also for the protein side, where every amino acid gets its own embeddings and, and functions and projections to basically understand how is the function ultimately encoded at the amino acid level. And these are some results from the program when we basically ask it to predict targets for cardiovascular disease, metastatic melanoma, Alzheimer's. It basically sort of starts making those targets and now we're closing the loop experimentally and start synthesizing those and uh, drive them. So I don't wanna leave you with too optimistic of a view because disease still reigns. We basically have, you know, in my own family, dramatic predispositions. Uh, each of us in this room carries mutations that are predisposing us to disease. And right now we're not doing anything with those mutations. We don't understand how to do prediction. We don't understand how to do preventive medicine. We don't understand how to do personalized medicine. 
all of this progress is not being translated. So what we need is to transform pharma, to basically enable personalized medicine. How can we do that? By basically thinking about the hallmarks of disease as the causal pathways and developing drugs for every one of those hallmarks systematically, and then enabling individualized treatments by combining the pathways that are unique to each individual. And for every person, we would love to understand what is the burden of that person at the genetic, epigenomic, transcriptional, imaging, every biomarker level from their blood, from everything, and <clears throat> combine disciplines. Basically bring AI together with biology, with chemistry, with biotechnology, with finance and pharma and patients and hospitals. And I think we are uniquely positioned in these engineering institutions to do this. It should be a collaboration across Greece, Europe, the US, because we're all in this together. So that's the message I want to leave you with. The last thing I want to say is AI is not only facilitating each of the parts, it's also facilitating the whole process. And we have built these tools for systematic visualization and manipulation of embedding uh, projections of ideas, of concepts of code, of proteins, of every aspect. And you can think of this as, so for example, these are the 155,000 papers that have cited our work. We've taken every single of them and projected them in embedding space. So we can now navigate through the space. And as you're zooming in, it basically gives you descriptions of these parts. And you can now combine multiple papers together and say, hey, you know, can I add and subtract and do operations in this embedding space directly? These are 10,428 meetings that we've had where we have transcribed every single one of them. And then uh, for every sentence, we know where that sentence is. Imagine basically sitting in a meeting, you have an agenda and the projections of this agenda. You basically see that each, you know, a given person only stays here and other people are kind of navigating through the meeting. Maybe 50 minutes into the meeting, you've only done this part and you know, there's so much to cover, et cetera. So we believe that AI can truly accelerate the discovery process itself. It can enable training of students, training of new team members uh, and enriching the ways we think we create, we collaborate, we plan, we reflect, looking both backwards and forward as to sort of where have we gone, where are we going, by summarizing, extrapolating, innovating, following up, and uh, connecting. I'll stop there because I'm, I'm really excited about the conversation and want to really thank this extraordinary computational team, experimental team, our amazing collaborators, very generous funding by the NIH, the Carol Thomas Fund Foundation, Down Syndrome, Novo Nordisk, and, and others. And I'll, I'll be delighted to switch to the panel. So how to do this? Should we yeah, take a few questions like first? A five minutes questions. Yeah. And then we can continue with the questions. time for questions. Don't be shy. You can ask your questions in any language. Uh, there are questions. Okay. Let me uh, go back to Zoom. <clears throat> Are predictive models only for AI or there are also machine learning platforms available for medical predictive testing? Leonida, how do you understand this question? Okay, and probably additional tools. Like ah, sure, sure, sure. So basically, <clears throat> uh, absolutely. Uh, these protein language models and large language models can be applied to many different places. I showed you an example where we use them at the patient level to basically understand the electronic health record of that patient, the doctor knows the outcomes, the logic behind the, the tools. We've applied it at the chemistry level. We've applied it at the protein level, at the biological function level, and to actually reason about the types of drugs that we should be developing for specific disorders. So these models are very broadly applicable. Other questions? You can ask them in Greek if you'd like. <laughs> Ε, στη διαφάνεια που δείξατε ότι επεμβήκατε στο γονίδιο, στα γονίδια ενός ποτικιού ναι. ε, έτσι ώστε να μην δημιουργεί ε, white fat cells ναι, ναι. Ε, μετά την ενέργεια την έξτρα την οποία συνέχισε να καταναλώνει γιατί από όσο καταλαβαίνω δεν επηρεάσατε και ποια ορμόνη ακριβώς. που προωθεί το να τρώει όπως τη λεπτίνη ναι, 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 ακριβώς Η ενέργεια αυτή τι έγινε, θερμότητα έγινε πιο... Ακριβώς, ακριβώς. So these mice are actually exothermic. These mice are actually burning heat. They are actually warmer. Οπότε ανεβαίνει η θερμοκρασία σώματος. Correct, correct. So basically the question is, um, 
is the, I mean, I'm going to rephrase your question a little bit. Basically, should we prescribe this to patients? What is going to happen? Are they going to be super hot? And the answer is probably yes. Are they going to start losing weight? The answer is probably yes. Are they going to stop eating because they're going to now be leaner? Probably yes. So basically the answer is not, you know, don't bother exercising, don't bother like dieting. On the contrary, this is to help people who cannot do those things because of various reasons, achieve a more normal level, if you wish, of body weight or muscle mass, et cetera, and then be able to uh, sort of have a, a healthier lifestyle in conjunction. The last thing I want is for people to get the message of, oh, great, I can now overeat and just burn it out. That's probably super unhealthy because every time you eat, there's oxidative phosphorylation, there's reactive oxygen species, there's all kind of byproducts associated with overeating. So we don't want that. Great question. Yeah. Hey, I have a less scientific one. Um, from the identification of the target to the research, to the development, from the whole chain, from the lab to the patient, what, what do you think is the most missing? Because you, in the end of the slide, you had innovation, keep trying connecting. What yeah. missing? What yeah. are the... From the societal perspective as well, what are the key parts, yeah. parties that could help? So when we talk about all of this um, sort of pathway here, uh, the question is what's missing? And the answer is um, all of the downstream work. Basically, you have the target, you design the molecule. What next? The next is something that you can just solve with AI. What we need is massive investment, massive collaboration, Basically, I think we should create a, a VC fund or some kind of philanthropic fund or a combination that basically says, how do we systematically translate academic discoveries into therapeutics? What does that need? That needs cellular systems for every one of those pathways in isolation. That needs organoid systems that basically uh, and organs on a chip that basically allows you to understand the interaction between the lipids the macrophages, the vasculature, you know, the, the microenvironment, the pressures, etc. basically create human models of these tissues and disease. You need to synthesize these molecules, understand their kinetics, their pharmacodynamics, you know, their, uh, you know, targeting, etc. So there's massive work that needs to happen downstream. And right now we have way, way, way too many predictions, way too many leads and the thing that we're missing is really massive investment. So, so I think that, again, we should think collectively as a society. Uh, you know, very often we're like, oh, here's another flood. It's going to take us a billion dollars to fix it. My mom was basically saying that, you know, 40 years ago, as an architect, she was basically predicting, like she was recommending building dams that were never built. Instead of building a dam for $100 million, we're basically cleaning up the flood for a billion dollars. So, so basically, I think that the cost savings that we can have as a society against Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, obesity, diabetes, you know, schizophrenia, every aspect, all of these things are costing so much more by waiting until they manifest. We should together invest for the benefit of all of society, and the cost is going to be minimal compared to the savings as a society. So, so I think we need to do this big time. Great. I think one last question. Hi, thanks for the talk. A bit more technical. On the part of the small molecule kind of graph representation learning, uh, and you also mentioned you apply this graph to the protein. So I was wondering if you can get a bit more specific. Is it like you provide these two graphs into one model and then learns together the binding affinity, or what does it learn? Yeah. On? No, it's so basically, again, we call it a multi tower model. So basically each of these towers stands in isolation because we're not going to retrain ESM. We're using the model as it is. We're not going to retrain BioGPT. We're using the model as it is. So most of the bottom layers are, are, are remaining unchanged. On the graph neural network side for the chemical, that we're learning from scratch. We're basically starting with functions of different chemicals and then project, projecting these functions as the highest level embedding of this multi-layer graph convolution which ultimately predicts the function for the complete molecule. But then you're, hold on, then, then you're projecting that back down to the individual embeddings of the individual chemical components. And that's on the chemistry side. On the protein side, we're doing exactly the same thing. 
where we're basically taking individual amino acids into domains and domains into protein function. And we already have the structure for tens of thousands of proteins. So we, are, we have the functional description for those proteins. So what we're trying to do is predict classes of function from the underlying structural embeddings. And that allows us to now start building a, a new tower for protein function. And that allows us to now, now, the last question is how do we combine the two towers? So you can look for chemicals that interact with the same protein and have that interaction as the function prediction and then see where is that encoded at the chemical level. You can look at protein that interact with the same chemical and then have that interaction as the ultimate prediction of that protein function. And then see where is that encoded on the amino acid function. So basically this joint learning of the two models that are each learned individually is connected now at the interface level through these tricks. It's, this model is not complete, but we have some initial results that seem to be working. So basically that's the direction that we're going into. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I am very tempted to turn the camera around and then we're going to be on that camera and you guys are going to be on this camera so that we can uh, uh, ask questions and, and sort of do the panel. Yeah, so we can sit just here, right? Yeah, yeah, or like, yeah, well, actually... Because that's your camera? Yeah. Are we going to use... Which camera are we going to use? Yeah, yeah, so then I think we're good. Okay, yeah. so I think we it's can... It's probably better if you can stand. Yeah. Okay, we can stand. Oh, I'm so sorry. And uh, I'm going to turn this around so that you can actually see the rest of the video. Thank you, Manoli. It was great. I mean, really, I, I think I burned a lot of brain calories <laughs> trying to follow all the different slides that they were coming like a thunderstorm one by one. Thank you so much. An amazing uh, work. I mean, so many different work we have done in so so few years. So I have uh, let me get, grab my notes. Okay. So now for the fireside chat, uh, we're gonna break it in four different points. One is gonna be AI in research. General talking about uh, the research in the forefront of research, and then the applications. That was also a question: how we can uh, AI affect healthcare and personalized medicine. The third topic is going to be about students here that they would like to dive into AI, machine learning, what they should do. And the last question is how to use AI for the creativity, like the last slide that, uh, like, uh, that you saw. Yeah. So let's start with the first uh, topic and uh, talking about AI and uh, research. It's obvious that uh, you are focusing on the single cell approaches. It's all of your slides, whether yeah. it's obesity, HPO, is affecting the other gene, what was the name, IRX3. And if you are not down, I burn fat in my sleep. But uh, when I'm gonna try to intervene on this single cell level, yeah. I'm gonna take a drug that's gonna systemically Correct. affect me, Correct. right? Yeah. So how that's gonna be able yeah. to- Yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic question. So basically before, when you ask what are the challenges, one of the words I mentioned was targeting. And that's exactly what I'm thinking about. So there's many ways to create. So, so <clears throat> uh, tell me if the sound is okay, by the way. So there are many ways to create uh, targeting. So basically what, what do we wanna do? We wanna change the circuit of one cell type, pre-adipocytes, not even all of adipocytes. How do you do that? One way is you could take a molecule that will then go everywhere and it will affect IRX3 everywhere. Probably not a good idea it because IRX3 is actually uh, pleiotropic. It has multiple functions in multiple cell types. The second is you intervene at the protein interaction level. And that protein interaction might be much more cell type specific because IRX3 with its targets or with a partner might only be found in that one cell type. A third approach is uh, exons of that protein that are only expressed in a cell type specific way. So even if the true target domain is somewhere else, you basically take an exon that is extremely cell type specific. Another approach, which we're actually uh, you know, un undertaking very actively, is to use antisense oligonucleotides to intervene, not at the protein level, not at the RNA level, but at the DNA level. 
And specifically, you can target the enhancer at the FTO locus. And you can basically say, if I shut off that enhancer, if I overexpress that enhancer using an antisense oligo, then I get the cell type specificity for free because enhancers are extremely cell type specific, even if the corresponding genes might have 20 enhancers, each in a different cell type. The last one is looking at specific uh, partner molecules that will basically recognize cell surface markers of only that cell type of interest and then allow the targeting. So you basically have adapters. You create, again, in a modular fashion, a set of adapters for 50 different cell types in the human body. And then the, the payload is only released when that adapter recognizes that cell type and enters. The sixth one is uh, stuff that Ron Weiss and others are doing in synthetic biology, where they're building specific sensors that this particular circuit will go into every cell type, but only that cell type of interest will have, you know, I don't know, a particular microRNA or a particular uh, lipid abundance or something, and then sense that and then activate the effector. So there's many ways of doing that, massive area of research. And then the, the, you know, the last one, maybe number eight or something, is topical application. So basically, we're looking for places where a topical application might do the trick. So basically, yeah. you could say, oh, I'm going to, like, I don't know, rub a cream that will only penetrate, you know, my adipocytes. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Nice. Again, you know, huge so area it's, of it's research. It's to target. Uh, well, you at know. At least, like, uh, uh, in a few years. Uh, so uh, I think there was this uh, interaction with Einstein where he basically said, if my theory was wrong, I wouldn't need 50 scientists to debunk it. <laughs> one would have been That's enough. True. And if I had an answer, I would have given you one. If I'm giving you 20, it means that we're still working. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. One uh, similar question, not now in the single cell level, but about the technologies. Yeah. You have done genomics, transcriptomics, epigenetics, uh, proteomics, single cell. I mean, there is a massive amount, vast amount of data that now are generating yeah. at the single level, but also on the population level. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, many AI models have been developed to analyze this data. What do you think, which type of data? I mean, I'm a pro proteomic person, so I'm a yeah. bit biased, but yeah. you have the expertise that you have done all different kinds of data. Yeah. What do you think is the most like uh, informative um, uh, piece of data yeah. that can help like therapeutic uh, uh, yeah. interventions, biomarkers? and? Uh, uh, so uh, proteomics. <laughs> 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 so... <laughs> So, um, I mean, even with proteomics, you have the protein abundance. What about the protein modifications? Yeah. What about the post-translational, you know, decorations of this protein? What about the targeting? What about the, you know, interactions, et cetera? I feel that every one of those is informative and every one of those comes at a cost. Yeah. Part of the reason why we've done so much single cell genomics is because it's now massively yeah. scalable. Yeah, yeah. So basically we can study, you know, 20 million cells you know, for something that's approachable. Yeah, but Whereas, the uh, proteomics now are catching up because they are using NGS technology. Yeah. In the past, I mean, they were that's just exactly right. So the, the, lonely... the beauty of proteomics nowadays is that you can couple next generation sequencing as readouts of proteomic activity. And then suddenly it enters the age of genomics mm -hmm. and then you can do that. So I think the answer is um, that the two are going to move side by side. On one side, the applications, to basically show the, the importance and the usefulness of particular modalities. And on the other side, the technologies that will enable those modalities. And the more we realize that, for example, I don't know, phospholipidomics is super important, then more technology will become possible and then more people will be able to do it and then we'll understand how much more important it is, et cetera. So I think that the two have to advance each other and push each other. If we had said, we're, we're gonna wait until sequencing technology is cheaper to sequence the human genome, that would have never happened because what drove the drop in price was the actual sequencing. So my answer is let's pay the premium price now because that's what's going to drive technology development. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think you're doing absolutely the right thing, going after something that's hard, showing that it's important because that's what drives the demand and ultimately the price. Okay. Uh, we're going to conclude the first uh, thing that was about yeah. AI and research. Let's go to the other topic, AI in healthcare and personalized medicine. You saw us that you're using LLMs, uh, generative AI, and you're going to have a computer that's going to tell you, uh, you're going to say to the computer that I have this kind of uh, phenotype, you're going to measure your multi-omics data, and it's going to tell you an intervention. Take this drug or the other drug. So you're going to have 
computer that is going to replace doctors uh, uh, and it's going to give you an answer about how you how do you think that's going to be applicable i mean if there're going to be like any legal consequences if that computer yeah, is uh, doing yeah. something if that ai model is doing something so so like let me be clear nowhere in my research did i say that we're going to replace any aspect of humanity okay so ai is there to augment humanity the llms are there to augment doctors and let me tell you the most basic thing even if the doctor knows nothing and even if we sort of diverge in a level where the doctor is only a human and the ai does all of the knowledge the doctor will still be needed because humans respond to humans much better than they respond to to to, to machines or robots so the human component is measurable in so many different levels. So even if it was just a placebo effect of, oh, I have a human who's caring for me, that will still make the patient better. So, so that's at the baseline. Suppose that humans don't have anything to contribute intellectually. And that's completely false. Humans still have a lot of common sense. They can take predictions that seem illogical and say, actually, no, that will kill the patient. In fact, in some of the examples that I showed, the AI model would have said, oh, listen, creatinine level, is associated with mortality increased risk only here and then it decreases and increases in here and, and then you know it decreases very much at the end and that's the, the the reason is that patients are undergoing dialysis at that point so a, a stupid ai model would have basically said oh you know if i want the best outcome i better go all the way to super high creatinine level and then that will kill the patient so basically i think that we're still at a level for the next many years to come where the ai model should ideally work side by side with the doctor to basically together arrive at a richer diagnosis. And I like to say that <clears throat> one of the problems with AI is that every time machines do something that we thought was hard and would have been intelligence, now we know how it works and we call it not intelligence anymore. <laughs> so basically uh, the, the, the problem is that the more and more we achieve this kind of capability, the more it demystifies it. And conversely, the stuff that machines are very good at, we, we sort of congratulate humans who can do those things. For example, factoring enormously large numbers, you know, that used to be a, you know, a circus trick or, <laughs> uh, you know, things where humans can do stuff that's like very machine-like. We are training doctors very often to not follow their humanity, to follow the protocol and to follow sort of very precisely you know, a flow chart. And that's what machines are best at. I think we should embrace that a doctor complemented with AI should be trained in a completely different fashion to basically understand the bigger picture rather than try to remember all of the special cases, et cetera. And I think that right now, um, doctors are wasting a lot of their time doing, you know, just memorization, filling out charts, writing summaries, you know, putting in ICD-9 billing codes and ICD-10 billing codes. Instead of basically the doctor spending most of their time with their patient, they have an AI partner that basically says, oh, you should check about that. And the doctor can basically say, oh, yeah, that, that's true. I didn't read about this or, you know, I didn't remember that, et cetera. And I can, and, and, and sort of after the visit ends, the video recording or the, you know, audio recording is automatically, you know, tabulated by the machine to basically save the doctor time and the doctors can spend more time with the patients. So I think that it's a symbiosis, it's not going to yeah, be yeah. a replacement. And then ultimately, the doctor is responsible. The yeah. doctor is the one who's making the decision. So the AI model, if it's wrong, it's the doctor's responsibility to say, no, I'm not going to trust it. So basically, but, in terms but, of the legal component, that's sort of, you know. Yeah, thanks. But there is an inherent limitation, right? I mean, uh, the whole uh, healthcare system is based on the Boolean logic. Either you, are, you have this disease or you don't have this disease. And you have this disease, you're going to take this drug. If you have like one melanoma cell, uh, you might not tell you someone that you yeah. have the disease. But, you know, life is different. Life is fuzzy. And do you think there is an inherent limitation about all these AI models that at the end of yeah. the day, 
they are not gonna they need to give an answer yes no yeah and they're gonna make an error yeah and if if you are a doctor society accepts that you can do an error but if you are a computer yeah society does not accept it's the same like driving cars and having like so let me let me start with the first part which is about probabilities posterior probabilities of different uh annotations for you know a particular uh patient and, and the answer is absolutely yes so basically we need to have models that can embrace the co-occurrence of multiple diseases together. Nobody has a single disease. Nobody has a single sort of uh, causality for their symptoms. It's always some kind of combination. And I think that uh, sort of a lot of traditional AI and machine learning has been very good about making the posterior probabilities explicit and basically saying, you know, I believe that it's some combination of this and this and that. I think currently the the current theme of LLMs is, oh, I'm going to give one answer and sort of explain the evidence for it. But even today's LLMs, I think you can ask them, well, considering the symptoms associated with disease, what do you think might be an additional underlying condition? Mm -hmm. And then this is prompt engineering. And I think that uh, <coughs> a lot of the future of these kind of reasonings for these models will be that the prompt engineering will be part of the system already. That the system will basically be saying, okay, you know, what about this option? And let me sort of reflect about an additional underlying cause, et cetera. So the, <clears throat> the way that a lot of these uh, la large language models are, are going is that some LLMs are basically being used as the glue for connecting other systems. And some of these other systems are themselves LLMs that might be more specialized. So you could be interacting with a high level LLM that basically, you know, has a uh, you know, sort of initial diagnosis module and a secondary diagnosis module and a Bayesian inference module and a sort of graph causality model and a, you know, um, knowledge graph model, et cetera. And all of these models are basically combined by the LLM. And that's already what ChatGPT is. ChatGPT under the hood is basically 10, 20 different, you know, underlying models, each trained for a different subset of data. And um, I think this provide that higher order logic. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, <laughs> if you look at the exponential progress that has happened in the last few years, I mean, transformers have only been around for, you know, a few years. And they're now the dominant architecture because they have this attention and self-attention and cross-attention sort of capability of effectively building a graph neural network on the fly mm -hmm. and sort of deciding which way are the embeddings going to be, you know, sort of influencing each other through this underlying network. Um, this is one very simple architecture. If you look even today with today's neuroscience understanding of the diversity of functions inside the human brain, this is just a neocortical architecture of pruning of synaptic connections. If you look at all the subcortical regions of sort of memory formation, connecting to multiple co-firing neurons or engrams at the same time, if you look at the, the, the layers of long range projecting, short range projecting, feedback going both up and down, both top down and bottom up, sort of you know, processing of creating these multi-model representations. Every time I say the word Apple, you don't think of just you know, a word, you think of a, an image, uh, you know, a shape, a color. There's everything that we do is multi-model. And I think that you know, AI is gonna be moving in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And again, all of this is just looking at modern AI. If you look at classical AI and all of the expert systems and rule-based and symbolic graph reasoning and sort of you know integration and mathematics, et cetera, there's so many things that we haven't yet plugged in to these models. And again, <laughs> there's so much more stuff to invent. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think we are at the infancy of these technologies. What I'd like you to reflect on is two curves. How fast have humans gotten smarter? And that's a very steep curve. And how fast has AI gotten smarter? And that's basically this curve, okay? And maybe AI is here, maybe it's here. But <laughs> if you look at the curve, yeah, you know, it, basically we have to embrace it as a partner, yep. as, a, as a peer, as a, something that can complement human intuition, human intellect, human empathy. So let me follow up on that. So how can, you can use, Instead of treating diseases, the best case is to prevent it. So there is a big hype about healthy aging, about uh, you know prevent diseases, and of course multi-omics data and AI can help you on that. How do you envision the future of that, and how the models can help you, not just telling you oh you know you have to lose weight. I mean just something more than. <laughs> 
what yeah. guidelines like uh, AI models can give you yeah. on this front? So, so um, let me start with the obvious. I'm going to give two pieces of advice to everyone in this audience. Eat healthy, <laughs> <laughs> sleep well, and exercise. So basically, healthy lifestyle, healthy diet is at the root of it all. And, uh, you know, looking around the room, it seems like you guys are already following the advice, which is great. Um, in terms of healthy aging more broadly, we show that you can restore cognition in mice just by restoring, you know, uh, cholesterol transport. Um, David Sinclair over at Harvard Medical School has this OSK cocktail that basically allows him to sort of reverse, you know, the age of neurons and, you know, restore memory, restore cognition, et cetera. We're starting to collaborate going down these paths. So basically, what are the epigenomic underpinnings of these OSK cocktail reversals? Uh, one of the questions is, how much of memory encoding is actually epigenomic memory? You know, yes, you can make me younger, but am I going to forget like my, you know, my, my, like the last 12 years or something? Uh, or, you know, the first 12 years. Uh, so there's many, many questions about sort of the molecular underpinnings of aging uh, slowdown and also aging reversal. And um, we have done experiments in my own lab where basically we can treat neurons in a particular way that makes them more regenerative even after injury. So neurons are one of the cell types that just doesn't regenerate in the human body. But if you sort of put them in a particular sort of condition, then they can actually regenerate. And, and basically, I think that there's going to be a molecular circuit underlying every aspect of human biology and physiology that we will eventually elucidate. And there are species where you cut off, you know, the head in half and you grow the other half and you now have two organisms. So regeneration is something that is there in the animal kingdom. So there, there's no impossibility about that. But in, in order to intervene then to humans, you have to call to call that a disease, right? You have to call that uh, you have to call that aging or neuromodulation or whatever you call it. So something uh, not prevented. So, so the question is, what is normal? If you basically look inside the room here, the IQ is probably around 130. Being 100 here, you could call that abnormal. <laughs> so so uh, when Michael Phelps like. I don't know, swims, you know, uh, a pool in, you know, no time, you know, I look handicapped next to him. So basically what, what is normal? Maybe, maybe as, and, and if you look at IQ, like a hundred years ago, the corresponding average IQ would have been 70 today. So by today's tests, humans a hundred years ago were IQ 70 on average. What does that say? That says that number one, environment matters, and that a lot of what we think of as genetic is in large part environmentally driven, in large part societally driven, in large part educationally driven. It also says that uh, you know the standards of both healthy lifestyle and you know healthy mind and memory, et cetera, are continuing to increase. <laughs> the uh, I have three undergrads that are uh, doing research in my group, uh, among many. And one of them has a first author nature genetics paper from high school. Another one has two books. She has been on the cover of Time, Mag Time Magazine. When she contacted me like a few months ago to join my lab, I Googled her, found a LinkedIn person, like, oh, that's not her. And then I you know, <laughs> kept looking for her. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, that's her. And she's in high school. So, so basically, I'm frightened for my son. Like my son is 11, my, my daughter is nine, and my third daughter is almost seven. And I'm, I'm basically saying, you know, like I would have never gone into MIT with like 10 year or 20, 30 year ago or standards. So basically I'm concerned about my own kids <laughs> because we are raising the standards. Mm -hmm. So when you're asking, should we intervene? This person seems healthy. Well, I'm sorry, if the average age is now 120 years old and this person is about to die at 93, I, yeah, to me, I would call that unhealthy. Yeah. So basically I think the answer is, that we need to continue seeking a higher level of life, of healthy aging, of cognition, of well-being, of every aspect of human health to, to levels that were unconceivable 200 years ago or 400 years ago. And even today, uh, you know, when we're into the future. So, so basically, as the standards keep increasing, the definition of normal is going to change. 
And then we will have a mandate to intervene for the vast majority of the population, if that's Thank what you. the new normal is. Thank you for sharing this thought. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, sure. We need to elevate all of humanity, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be AI alone helping to elevate. Some of that is going to be, you know, improving our own health, our own environment, our own upbringing, you know, maybe uh, stuff that mothers will need to take in utero to yep. basically facilitate healthy development yep. and, you know, and if yep. you don't do that, it will be unfair to your child. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's go now to the third topic. It's going to be a very short one because we don't have the yeah. many minutes available. It's going to be about the students here. I mean, about AI and education. You, you see here a lot of audience. I think we have another 40 minutes. I'm okay with that. I think we should... Uh, well, are we still finishing at 7 o'clock? I have an event at 8. eight right. Yeah, so 7.30 is fine. <laughs> I mean, you saw me come from the airport, right? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay to go like for another. There are questions. There are questions we'll, from the audience, right? No, we'll open yeah, it up. Yeah, just, we'll open it up. Again, the okay. conversation is so interesting, fascinating. I'm sure you guys have a thousand questions, so I don't want to stop it in 10 minutes. Okay. Let's go, you and I, for another 10 minutes and we'll open it Okay, up. great. So let's talk now about the third topic about education, about all the students here. I mean, they might like to, to grow, learn AI, yeah. and so on. What do you think? They should focus on. I mean, what this would be like. Uh, 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 yeah, how how. So the I have skill a list. sets that they need to have. I brought a list here. So in about seven years, the top courses are going to be, and in twenty four years, the top. <laughs> I have no idea. Is the question. So basically, I again, I have three kids: eleven, nine, almost seven. I'm constantly spending like I don't know twenty hours with them, tutoring them a week. What about? everything from math to history to learning to science to you know everything why what do i tell them i tell them listen chat gpt can answer all these questions do you want chat gpt to be answering other questions for you the answer is no why what is school for what is education for education for all of you guys is to learn how to think period everything else is just a trick to get you to learn how to think period. Exams, they're there to trick you to learn. Homeworks, they're there to sort of help you <laughs> develop the exam, to trick you to learn. Every aspect of education is to trick you to learn and to learn how to think. Now, the only advice I can give you right now is do the thing that's the hardest. <laughs> so I remember from, uh, you know, reading books uh, when I was a kid, basically, I, I, I still remember the vivid picture of Iraklis, you know, choosing the two paths. One was, you know, going uphill into like rocks, et cetera. And the other one was going downhill. And, you know, in a case, basically chose the path of virtue, the, the hard path. So I've basically done that every single time. Every single day, I'm like, what's hard? What do I find hard to understand? That's what I'm going to study today. <laughs> and the reason is that I'm, I just learn, love learning how to think, learning how to learn. And the rest will come. So basically, my advice to you is be fearless nothing is indomitable you can conquer any mountain of knowledge any aspect of education any aspect of stuff you now have the tools at your disposal what are these tools number one your classes they are the breadth your professors number two your research they are the depth and number three online videos i have posted probably 120, 200 hours of, of videos from my own lectures on the web. So you don't have to go to MIT. You can just listen to them from your, you know, I don't know, from the beach or from your dorm or from, you know, your house. So basically, um, and I'm not the only one. I've been doing this for, I don't know, 10 years now, but basically people have been doing this a lot with much higher production value than just me recording myself. You have these extraordinary tools and resources out there to learn almost every topic. And there's amazing content producers for just hardcore AI, machine learning, biology, neuroscience, every aspect of human science and thought is there out there on the web. And number four, you have ChatGPT. I had a guest lecture in my class for part of a lecture a few weeks ago, and I sat down in the front row next to the students. And then I see the person next to me had ChatGPT open. And I'm like, awesome. He says, it's for the dumb questions. And I'm like, there are no dumb questions. 
So basically, the, um, the, 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 the fact that for every aspect of learning from my kids' homework, like what is, I don't know, um, an interjection. <laughs> like I had no idea what an interjection is. I went to primary school in Greece. It's like when you say, wow, or yikes, like that's apparently an interjection. But I asked GPT, what is an interjection? How is that different from a proposition? How is that different from, I don't know, an adjective? And, uh, you know, it, like I learned all that stuff in Greek. I have no idea. So basically I sat down next to my son and I'm like, okay, here's how we learn. And then he's like, um, when tectonic plates collide, why does, uh, you know, why does the lava go up? For example, if the lava is heavier than the underlying rock, why does it go up? I asked ChatGPT. I'm like, okay, great. Let's ask ChatGPT. I mean, I, you know, I have my own ideas, but it gave me 10 answers. I would have given him one. So, so basically for any ridiculously hard, complicated concept that you want to learn, ask it. It will tell you. Ask again about that one part. It'll tell you. Ask again about that one smaller part. It'll tell you again. So basically teachers are amazing, but they're not your only resource nowadays. So, so basically tackle like take any research paper and I have 20 in my backpack. <laughs> like I should show you, like, I, you know, I travel with research papers. Like I'm still reading <laughs> research papers. So that, you know, this is what I travel with. I'm constantly learning. And as I'm learning, I have ChatGPT next to me to ask questions about stuff that I don't understand. Okay. Because like, there's nothing wrong with not understanding. I'm human, like all of us. And I feel that it should be a badge of honor. Ooh, today I didn't understand three things. <laughs> because if you understood everything today, you're probably not challenging yourself enough. And today I didn't understand three things. And yeah, guess what? I sort of learned them eventually, or I think I kind of understand them. Okay. So I challenge you all to take on new things, learn new things. Every discipline is within reach and you have the tools out there. You have your professors, you have your classes, you have your friends and your peers that you can co-learn together. You can basically create study groups. Hey, let's take on that thing together. And you can kind of explain to each other. And you have ChatGPT and, of course, the extraordinary internet resources. I hope that helps. Yep, yep, amazing. Okay, uh, I think we, let's uh, also cover the fourth topic, which is the last one. It's about uh, AI innovation, and then we can open the discussion to, uh, to the people here and also to the audience. So the last topic is AI innovation. Mm -hmm. You saw us at the very end that you're using AI and embedding space to get like all the ideas, all the papers, so that this is amazing. So you're using AI to find ideas, right? Can you comment a little bit on that? And uh... I, I'm gonna go a little more philosophical here. I hope that's okay. So I showed you a picture of these islands that have been covered by the different papers that cite our work. And I showed you these cartoon-like islands, you know, of, of different, um, you know, uh, places in, in cognitive space. <clears throat> I have interacted a lot with ChatGPT. I have had, probably hundreds of conversations, pushing deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's remarkably good. It's, it's you know, I mean, for many things where, like every time I try to test it, it kind of does poorly. But when I try to test it, these are things that are very limited and, and therefore, you know, this is not what it's made for in some ways. But Reflecting a little bit at the types of problems that my son is doing in Russell School of Mathematics, okay? So, you know, uh, I don't know, Jill can finish a job in three hours, Joe can do it in two hours, and Jack can do it in five hours by themselves. If they all work together, how long will it take to do that job? Right? So you have to basically say, okay, the relative rates is such and such. You know, when I add them all together, then the relative rate is going to be whatever the sum of the those is. And therefore, the total area of work, the rate of each person times the length, you know, has to be constant. So then the length is going to be shorter because the height of the rates together is going to be higher, etc. This is one class of problems. Okay. And, you know, he maybe got 10 of them and he eventually figured out how to solve that class of problems. So I'm, I'm starting to think. Are humans just, you know, a small number of classes of problems? Maybe in the Russian School of Mathematics, you know, maybe there's a hundred problems that he'll learn. You know, he's in sixth grade right now. Uh, so um, maybe by the time he's 18, there's 400 math problems or 4,000 math problems. But I'm constantly worrying, is that it? Is that basically what humans have achieved? And I would love 
for it to be true that in a hundred years of more progress, we are now in 2023, in 2123 or 2323, that we'll look back at 2023 and say, wow, we had only explored this tiny little island of these vast oceans of knowledge. And this is a little bit of where I'm going with this sort of space of ideas. I'm basically saying, well, if you map it all, which we now can, will it be finite? Will Aristotle and Plato and Shakespeare and, you know, all of the great thinkers of the past, you know, 20 centuries, will they be just, you know, a few little things here? And again, you read the ancient Greek tragedy and you're like, well, we haven't gone that far, have we? And is it possible that humans with our cognitive apparatus have only explored so much and that with AI partners, we'll be able to push that to limits that are just yet unthinkable. So that's the first thing that I'm thinking. Hold on. Um, the other is um, that as we are, just one second, I had a thought and I lost it, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so, 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 so that's one part. And um, I'm sorry, I had a point to make. Okay, never mind. Go ask you. <laughs> no, it's about, uh, but you're one, one of the very first people that are using AI to tell you what ideas you should look at, right? You're using yeah. models to tell you where to drive your yeah. research, yeah, yeah. right? So, so I mean, let, me, let me go back a little bit to those models. So we now have a map of all of the ideas in science, at least tangentially related to our work. And the other thing we have is gradients. Like imagine a vector space where every point has a vector of where is science going after you're there? What's next? And we can kind of follow those gradients and basically see, imagine if you're reading a book, instead of reading it linearly, you could say, well, here's everything I already have mapped in knowledge space. And here's the parts that I need to explore. How should I attack them? And it'll give you the gradients of which way you should attack the different chapters in the book, for example. So in the same way, I can imagine societies following these gradients of, you know, sort of discovery. And what we're doing with my students right now is just having fun. We're basically saying, okay, let's take this point and that point and add them up. Let's actually read the paper that comes out of that. And we're reading and we're like, well, this is actually kind of good. So, so basically we are creating what we call outbedding. So basically embedding means putting it into this bed of ideas. Outbedding means sort of, you know, plucking from there. And that's a much harder problem. So basically we're trying to sort of generate proteins from that space of ideas. We're trying to generate you know, new new molecules, new papers, new text, new code from that space. So I'm kind of excited about the, the prospects of, you know, seeing the, oh yeah, I remember the thing that I wanted to say. <laughs> um, so so um, AI and machines are burning, what, 10,000 times more energy than you are to think of the same thing. Um, there's several constraints to human cognition, okay? One of them is just the energetic needs. Just, you know, we only have so many counters. Uh, second is the space. Basically, if you look at the volume to actually go through the birth canal, and, you know, that has constrained our, our, the volume of our brain, and sort of there's like all these convolutions. Um, the third one is evolvability. Basically, it has to be a local maximum that's reachable through evolutionary space. You can't just like, you know, create human cognition or this intelligence out of nowhere. You have to be able to evolve to it. And the fourth constraint is that you have to be able to develop to it from a single sperm and egg, a single, uh, you know, a single uh, zygote to be able to, through development, create this extraordinary apparatus. So like the fact that we're even able to think of these extraordinary things is magical in so many ways. And it should be no surprise that we should be able to create cognitive architectures in the next three years is my guess. But in the next 300 years, for sure, that vastly surpass these amazing capabilities that we have from our evolution you know, in Africa over you know, um, just not so, not so long ago in evolutionary terms. So I think that the partnership of AI and human cognition can push us to frontiers yet unimaginable. 
And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have such a partner for the benefit of all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And then we can worry about, you know, the future of work, we can worry about societal issues, et cetera. And, yeah, yeah, you know, much. that, that, you know, there's a lot of philosophy to, to discuss yep. there, sociology, economics, et cetera. But I'm, I'm actually thrilled to have finally a partner that's our match. Yep. Yeah, I think now we can open the discussion yeah. to, the, uh, to the people. Floor is open. Uh, Manoli, you gave an interview to Lex Friedman a few months ago. You spoke yeah. about evolvability. And you bring it today as well, which is fascinating. I hear to the interview almost weekly. It's uh, inspiring to put the AI into context, the evolution of the civilization, etc. The question I have is for the Greeks. We are here. We uh, we live here. We live in Greece. We have fantastic brains. How do we catch up? How do we evolve? How do we? Uh, keep the momentum or even build it if we don't have it from the innovation perspective what can we do in that ecosystem in that context other than just going abroad to find the right coaches so so Lenita, come come up um so so, so um a student yeah i have three kids and i'm you know yeah. Russian school of mathematics we don't have that thing in so, so, so what do we do uh leonidas uh studied at mit at harvard with the top professors, and he's here doing work that I think is at the top of the world. So you can tell us a little bit more <laughs> at, about, about the landscape of innovation here. You have a company, you have an academic group. Tell us a little bit about the ecosystem of innovation here. Uh, well, I mean, there are a lot of differences between Greece and the US. Uh, I made the decision to come back to, to, to Greece uh, 12, uh, 13 years ago. And I think it was a great decision. I really love it. And I really have fun with the students and with the entrepreneurship and the company that I have started and the new one that I'm planning to start. And if you are not based on the Greek, if you are based on the Greek ecosystem to find uh, people to work with, but uh, you are really based on the world, you are, you are a partner of the world and you're playing in the world and you're providing services, products in the world, then uh, it's amazing to be in Greece because you combine two amazing things. Being in Greece with your family, <laughs> the nice weather, enjoy life, really. And then you also enjoy research and uh, you're enjoying like uh, innovation and you're traveling all around uh, the world. So I feel that uh, I was, uh, even though the decision back in 13 years ago, it was very hard. I had to cut my salary tenfold. I had to do like many different things. At the end of the day, it paid out. So uh, I really enjoy, but you have to collaborate with Manolis people. You have to, to be like on the state uh, of the art. So, so, so environment matters enormously. And I think, um, I think that's a call to the Greek government to basically, you know, make the environment as excellent as possible. Because... Like Ipiazza Kuleme, the basically you, you you can't just be the odd one out working your butt off. Like basically, I I'm a workaholic. <laughs> I, I love my job. I wake up at 4 a.m. every day and I'm like eager to get started because I only have four hours until I have to go to work. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like quick. Like if I if I you know waste the first half hour, I don't know, reading the latest articles, I'm like. I had stuff to do, like I need to do them. So basically the, and, and everyone around me is a workaholic as well. And I think that makes it normal. If I was the only crazy one, I would be out of place. People would look at me funny, but no, I'm not the only one. Like I, you know, I get emails from my research team at like 3 a.m. and I respond at 4 a.m. So it's, it's self-reinforcing and it's just such a magical, magical thing. So basically, I think being in an environment with other driven people is extremely important. The second thing is having peers. Remember when I was saying earlier, oh, choose a few people that you want to study the subject with. I think that camaraderie is extremely important. The, the, you know, the, the concept of the human aspect. And I think that's something that Greece should build on. Basically, you have people who have similar culture, similar references, similar points of anchor that you can sort of perceive the world through and that, you know, 
you can um, sort of build together for. Um, uh, Apas, I'm sorry, I'm going to call on you as well to tell us a little bit about sort of the, uh, I don't know, basically what 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 is Greece doing in that innovation ecosystem? How can, you know, we better embrace AI? Because I think that's, come on, come on here. <laughs> that, you know, that's, a, that, and again, I, I, I don't want to, like, I don't know the answers. I'm just like telling you from my perspective, but there's people who are embedded in this ecosystem. And if you would like to add not just questions, but answers, please raise your hands. Vasilia, you know, please, please come up as well. I would love to sort of hear your perspective from the entrepreneurship side. Basically, like Vasilis is, you know, co-head of this Hellenic Innovation Network where companies are, are sort of competing for ideas, not at just the, at the Greek level, at the European level, at the world level, and sort of showing extraordinary innovation. So I think you need to build on, on sort of the, the talent here. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Hi, Manoli, great to have you. I am Mapas. Uh, I used to be a student of Manolis uh, for a while, did research there. It is on, but I think you can hear me slightly better now. Um, now I'm back in Greece. I work with, with Minister Pirakakis back before we were, we were a digital and now we're at Ministry of Education. Um, so yeah, lots of great points for me to talk about, I guess. <laughs> uh, putting me on the spot. Um, now I guess the, the overall idea is we have the talent, we have people. Um, I think we have the incentives and you mentioned some of them um, and it would be, it just needs work to get, uh, get it, get it done. Um, I come from the innovation um, community from startups before I did research. Uh, so I've seen the startup community being less than 50 people when we were doing the first off and coffee meetups, 2008, 2007, uh, when I was a, uh, high school student and now it's a very big community with unicorns and companies that have exited for more than billion or dollars or so about so i guess there is progress that has been made in the last decade and should increase and should keep going um yeah it, it's a collective effort not much and lady can i ask you to just say a few words about the bio the bio park please please yeah. <laughs> so what's the question? I missed the question. I was not a good student. So 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 the question is, uh, what do we need in this Greek ecosystem, and what what do we already have? Basically, what are some of the efforts? So the, the, you know, the question is, should we all leave, or what can we do in Greece? How can we compete with this type of innovation? And my answer is, there's so much here, and and you guys are all just examples of of that. Uh, one of the things that uh, certainly is totally different uh, here and there. Is the ego competing one another? Yeah, um, when I went to MIT, uh, I saw professors that they were willing to admit that they had no clue about the um, answer to a certain problem. If you find a professor here with a few exceptions admitting <laughs> that, um, that's a totally different question. So I think <clears throat> we have a lot of the talent and a lot of the people um uh, we have the resources now gpt is everywhere uh um and and a lot of other computing stuff the mentality is changing uh i'm grateful to leonidas for inviting me to uh, teach this class yeah. uh, last year was the first time we had a few people like uh thanos here and i think i i saw somebody else as well uh he left <laughs> and we managed to build only two startups. Now we have, what, 25 people? Um, and we are on for building eight startups. And these are eight uh, biotech startups in the National Technical University of Athens, wow. which is unheard of. Like, you know, wow. before uh, uh, hearing about uh, Lenida's uh, lab, I thought, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, graduate and it was men wrenches and <laughs> some torches and stuff like that so things are changing uh, and the fact that you are here on a, nine, <laughs> seven o'clock, on a tuesday evening i think it says a lot so uh we should stop complaining we should start uh uh you know comp comparing ourselves to other people and we should start just making the best we can. So I love it. So now Eleni is creating this biotech park 
for companies, for common global infrastructure, for academics to live together just like 30 minutes from here. So tell us more. Yeah, so thank you, Manon, for putting me on the spot as well. <laughs> well, our idea is that we basically have to stop this discussion about whether Greece can do things here, you know, and we see that we have all these great minds when they go abroad, they do tremendous things. And then for some reason that we very much know now, we just can't replicate that here. So what we noticed is that in pharma and biotech, you need specialized infrastructure in order for startup companies to test their ideas and for the ecosystem to grow, then bridge them with, you know, putting them in contact with the grants because you need the funding, you need pharma that will collaborate with them to identify which are the ideas that are worth working on, finding some of them, co-developing some of them. You need a very close collaboration with academia as well that are working on all these very um, cutting edge research. So our idea is that we're putting up a space that will be a micro ecosystem of what we see in Boston and in more uh, the more advanced ecosystem. So we have a biotech incubator that will host uh, startup companies in the life sciences. We have a preclinical CRO services, which is basically what a company needs to do in order to start the translation. How do we screen molecules, compounds? How do we pick which ones to work on? And then of course we have uh, a translational research unit, which is where I hope we can collaborate with Manolis and uh, and, Leonidas and uh, you know people who do research like this to, to identify a few early projects to test them and validate, you know, also the, the new way that you are identifying targets. Yeah, because yeah. I think that will be necessary. Beautiful. Thank you guys. Thank you. So sorry for bringing you all on the spot. Thank you. <laughs>
And don't worry, I'll check to see if they're right. So that's the sound. The second part is, are they actually created? So I have friends at Harvard, for example, that, um, and you know, Leonard Boussieu comes to mind, who actually gave a salon at my house on uh, AI and the frontiers of human creativity, just like two weeks ago. And uh, Jackie uh, at Harvard uh, on the LEAF uh, project, that's basically looking at, can we have a collaboration between AI and humans and see if we can push the frontiers of creativity? If we can kind of find solutions by collaborating with AI that humans alone wouldn't have found. And you can put that in a, com in a competitive space. You can basically say, let's have an idea competition and we're going to have entries and we're going to evaluate those entries for how creative they are. And some entries will be only humans, some entries will be only AI, some entries will be humans and AI. And the answer is human and AI together are much more creative and also sound. So basically, I, I think that there's, you know, uh, I hope that answers your question in terms of we can achieve both and AI can indeed help us push the boundaries of creativity. Other questions? Yeah, Elena. You're talking about fascinating research you showed us before. I'm curious if you asked your model to select, you know, how, where to invest in all of these. Uh... Yeah, so there was a, there was a recent, um, article in the news that was basically saying that they basically took human investors and ChatGPT and put them side by side and ChatGPT actually made more money based on the investments that it was it was suggested so you know that's that's one one possibility the other question is if i ask ChatGPT for what are good ideas what are sort of innovative ideas i'm going to rephrase your question a little bit and um the like i have a friend who basically told me oh uh he's an experimentalist and he says I should, you know, I asked a few questions to ChatGPT and it suggested a few experiments to do. I looked at them, thought a lot about them, took a while. And, you know, yeah, one of them was a very creative idea I hadn't thought of and I'm, I'm actually pursuing it now. So, so, yes, you can actually, you know, use AI to sort of, you know, push into new directions. But again, this is not like, oh, give me all the answers. I'm going to be working for you. No, I'm not going to be working for ChatGPT. No, it is my assistant. And I'm going to be using it to sort of evaluate and perhaps think outside the box. And I use that enormously in so many different areas. Summarize this. Oh, you know, basically for my class, we have, oh, you know, 120 students. We asked them what, you know, like what projects do you want to work on? I took all the titles, you know, combined them into themes. And I said, okay, great. We now have eight themes. And, you know, it took me a minute instead of having to read every title, et cetera. So I think it can facilitate sort of this exploration, depth, confirmation, understanding a new area, et cetera, always with a grain of salt. You, you can't just trust it blindly. Two minutes, no, four minutes left, four minutes left. I think in the last four minutes, I would like to put on spot one more person. Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. I'm very lucky that I know you know for so many years, but I also know your parents. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, θα ήθελα να σχολιάσετε λίγο για το Μανώλη, πώς ήταν στα παιδί. Πέρα από το ότι μεταφέρετε κάποια γονίδια, είναι σίγουρο, αλλά παίξετε και καθαριστικό ρόλο. Σαν γονείς, κάνετε το επόμενο βήμα, πήγατε στη Γαλλία, στείλατε όλα σας τα παιδιά στο MIT. So, so before we go to the, yeah. to the, you know, uh, up, I want to first say that, you know, the most important thing I've created in, in my lifetime are these three things. <laughs> so, so this is uh, Yanis, named after my father. This is Cleo Anna, named after my mother, the Anna part. And then Elora Sophia. So uh, first of all, I have to say that Anna is the best grandmother in the world. Uh, <laughs> the kids love love spending time with her but yeah uh, I mean as I'm looking at my three kids and saying what am I doing right as a father I'm basically saying well you know like me and my brother and my sister we can criticize my parents all we want but they put their three kids through MIT like my brother my sister and I all went to MIT as undergrads I mean I don't know how much more successful you could get for for for, for a parent so anyway yeah, yeah the floor is open Είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά να είμαι εδώ να ακούω το Μανώλη 
και να βλέπω όλα αυτά τα νέα παιδιά γύρω. Ε, πολύ λίγα κατάλαβα. <laughs> αλλά αυτό που ένιωσα είναι τελείως διαφορετικό. Ε, νιώθω μια ενέργεια εδώ μέσα, <laughs> η οποία ξεκινάει με την ομιλία στη Μανώλη, α, αλλά συγχρόνως ε, στο τέλος μιλήσατε για το πώς κάποιος μπορεί να προχωρήσει, αν κατάλαβα. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Ε, ο Μανώλης σαν παιδί, oh. σαν, ε, ε, ήτανε, ε, είχε κάποια, ε, έβλεπε τα πράγματα λίγο διαφορετικά. Ε, του έχει χαρίσει εδώ σε ένα υπέροχο μυαλό ε, και μικρές αφορμές του δίναν την ευκαιρία να προβληματιστεί. Αυτό, αυτό που θα πω είναι τα πάζλα. Τα πάζλα. Δηλαδή η μητέρα μου αυτό που έκανε είναι ότι πάντα έπαιζε. Ο πατέρας μου ήταν ο σοβαρός. Αυτό ήταν η δουλειά, δουλειά, δουλειά. Η μαμά ήταν όλο παιχνίδι. Πάζλε, πεζοκεφαλιέ, κάκι, τα πάντα. Οπότε μου άρεσε να λύνω προβλήματα και τα πήρα σαν παιχνίδι. Και αυτό που θέλω να πω σε όλου και στου γονεί με παιδιά και στα παιδιά που είναι ακόμα παιδιά και ελπίζω να μείνετε παιδιά για πολλέ ακόμα δεκαετίε, είναι μην χάσετε το παιχνίδι, τη χαρά τη έρευνα, τη χαρά του να λύνω πάζλε. Γιατί δεν είναι όλα δουλειά. Δηλαδή. Εγώ δεν νιώθω ότι δουλεύω. Άμα ήμουν ζάπλουτο, άμα είχα ας πούμε, 10 δισεκατομμύρια, τι θα έκανα. Θα τα δίνω άλλο στο MIT και θα του έλεγα: Δεν μου λε, έχει κανένα γκρουπ σπουδαστών που μπορώ να δουλεύω μέρα νύχτα, σταμάτητα για να δουλεύει το μυαλό μου. Ακριβώ αυτό θα έκανα. Και ξαφνικά αυτό είναι η δουλειά μου. Με πληρώνουν. Δηλαδή, δεν θα μπορούσα να φανταστώ καλύτερο μέρο στον κόσμο για να πάρω σύνταξη. Γιατί άμα δεν χρειαζόταν να δουλεύω, ακριβώ αυτό θα έκανα. Οπότε το να λύνει κανεί παζλ είναι μια χαρά, είναι μια. Πώς το λένε, σε γεμίζει. Και νομίζω ότι αυ- αυ- αυτή τη χαρά θέλω να κρατήσετε όλοι μέσα σας για πολλές δεκαετίες της παιδικής σας ηλικίας. Να σταματήσουμε εκεί. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ.